the setting of the story of Jesus' final appearance to the disciples in the Gospel of Luke it takes place on Sunday evening, immediately after the two who had met Jesus on the road to Emmaus had told their story to the disciples in Jerusalem, and then they had also shared with the two of them, the Lord has appeared, has risen, and has appeared to Simon. So it was while they were talking about all this that Jesus appeared in the midst of them. He stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, a reminder of the basic storytelling dynamics of this story. The storyteller becomes Jesus and is addressing the audience as the disciples. So in your telling this story, you are addressing the audience as the disciples who are gathered with the two who were on the road to Emmaus. And the audience is invited to identify with the disciple. And so the dynamic of the story is then you are speaking to the audience as the 10, 12 uh, disciples who are gathered together there in that room, talking about the appearances of Jesus on the road to Emmaus and to Simon Peter. When Jesus appears, their response, with which then you are seeking to lead the audience to identify, uh, is fear and terror and thought they were seeing a ghost. That is, they did not understand who it was. Now, there's a basic difference then between your audience and the disciples. Because the audience has heard the story of Jesus appearing on the road to Emmaus, they know that it's quite likely that this really is Jesus. The disciples don't know. So that characteristic move in these resurrection stories of the audience knowing something that the disciples don't know is present here. And that's part of the delight of this story, is on the one hand being able to identify with and understand the disciples' response, and on the other hand knowing uh, that, uh, in fact, the one who they are talking to is really Jesus. It isn't a ghost. And so that effect is uh, very important. However, another dimension of this is that the disciples embody the audience's ambiguity. And that ambiguity is essential to the disciples' credibility as characters. If the disciples had instantly believed, the audience would have been alienated from them as ignorant dupes, that is, who were being taken in. So Luke's audience is intelligent, and they would not simply dismiss such disciples as naive fools. But as a result of the disciples' skepticism in the story, the overall impact of this is to increase the credibility of their belief that, in fact, it was the resurrected Jesus who spoke to them. So implicit in the story is the recognition that belief in the risen Christ is only possible on the other side of an encounter with disbelief and terror uh, at the presence of Jesus. Now, a major factor in the dynamic of this story, as you tell it, is the spirit of the words of the risen Christ. That is, what is the character of Jesus like here? and How are you going to tell his words? What's his attitude toward the disciples and the audience? Generally, the words of Jesus in this story are read with a tone of complete emotional detachment as a pronouncement from a disembodied person. And if there's any impatience in his voice, it's a judgmental, critical impatience. But I do not think that this is the way that the story was told. The field of discourse, characterization of this story, is the trickster traditions. In the trickster stories, the trickster is usually having fun, sometimes at the expense of those he encounters. But the trickster's fun is almost always beneficent. So Jesus is here presented in the tradition of Jacob and Joseph. You remember 
those stories. You know, Jacob tricked his brother, Esau, out of the uh, inheritance by pretending to be Esau with his father. So he tricked his father. Now, that's not necessarily beneficent. In the end, it turned out to be because Esau accepted it. The story of Joseph is more explicitly beneficent. Joseph does not reveal to his brothers who he is when they come down to Egypt, and he continues to put them through a kind of ordeal, and that's part of the delight of the story, is Joseph uh, tricking into his brothers into thinking that he is only the second man in command in, in Egypt, and only later reveals who he is. So part of the delight of the story is then that dynamic of knowing what's going on. Well, the same thing is present here. Jesus is presenting himself to the disciples, but they do not understand. So Jesus is here fully human. That's why it's important for his words to be spoken in a way that conveys human emotion. So Jesus is impatient with his disciples' uncertainty and fear. So he first of all you know, says to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it's, it's I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and blood as you see that I have. And then he showed them his hands and his feet. And their response then is both joy and disbelief. And so his impatience even grows. All right, all right. Do you have anything to eat? And so he took the fish that they gave him and he ate it. Now, what is expressed here is a crescendo of emotion. And it is also delightful. Jesus' words invite the listeners to explore their own internal responses with a, a sly smile and a twinkle in the eyes. They're in the same spirit as his words to the two on the road. Ah, you fools, and slow to believe all that the prophets have said. So the risen Christ asks these questions in a spirit of love and of understanding. So his words about his hands and feet are in response to their initial surprise and terror, and are the words of a person who is not recognized. You know, it's, it's like Joseph saying to his brothers, look at me, it's me, I'm your brother. So Jesus' response, why do you question like this in your hearts, is an invitation to see and to touch. And the disciples' response is then never fully described. The response happens in the audience. And so the invitation of the story and what you are doing in terms of in the telling of the story is to invite them to experience the delight and reversal of expectations that the disciples experience. As a result, the rest of Jesus' talk, his blessing, the ascension itself, are all experienced by the audience as part of Jesus' response to their disbelief. And the whole of this talk, then, that follows their conviction of uh, his uh, identity, of who he is, which is clearly implied, is then their being commissioned. So Jesus' words to them are a reference to the scriptures. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is Jesus functioning as a rabbi and pointing to the things in the scriptures that prophesied the uh, fulfillment of the crucifixion and the resurrection. Now, if you ask the question, what are those prophecies? The answer is, there aren't any. That is, the prophecies that uh, the Messiah would suffer and die 
and be raised are virtually absent. But what is present throughout the Torah and the prophets and the Psalms is the transformation of death, disaster, trauma into new life for the people, for the prophets, for Moses. So there are then a whole series of stories that have this framework of the transformation of disaster into new life. So Jesus' final statement is then, it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed. Now, where is this written? Well, it's written primarily in the Gospels. It is written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this is also an expression of the celebration of the power of writing in the life of the early church. And of the full inclusion of writing and of the writing of the Gospels as a central dimension of the communication system of the early church. So Jesus then blesses them, takes them out to Bethany, and ascends into heaven. It is the sign of his being exalted to the right hand of God and of his vindication as the Messiah and as the ruler of the world. So the invitation to the audience then is to identify themselves as Jesus' witnesses, as ones who will tell his story. And in this, Luke shares this basic motif uh, with uh, the commissions at the end of all four of the Gospels, all of which end with in one way or another, either indirectly, as in Mark, or directly, as in the commission in Matthew, and of Peter's commission at the end of John, to faithfully follow and shepherd Jesus' flock and communicate the gospel throughout the world. That is, tell the story everywhere.